this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy. Be sure to check out our blog and our YouTube channel and great sponsors, your Dolce Vita, Italy Rooting, Phil Italy, and Abitiva Casa. And today my guest is uh, Andrew Martin, uh, who has a great podcast of his own dedicated to genealogy. So welcome, Andrew. Thanks for being here. Hello, Bob. It's an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Uh, yes, and uh, we, we spoke a couple of weeks ago when I was a guest on your show, so uh, we're going to follow up and yes. get people to know your show, hopefully. <laughs> um, so before we start, the first and most important question is, what is the name of your podcast? The name of my podcast is, handily, The Family Histories Podcast. Yes, and uh, um, and it's, it's a great podcast it is. Uh, a little bit switch for me because typically we go into, you know, we talk about Italian genealogy, but to me, you know, all genealogy is important and, you know, my kids are adopted. So uh, my daughter has a lot of uh, English and uh, French roots and my, my son has uh, some Spanish and Puerto Rican roots. So it's, it's always great to talk about these mixtures. Um, so I'd like to ask you, because I know you have a unique way of, uh, starting your interview. So why don't you talk, I know you have like three components of the interview. So why don't you tell people about how that works? Well, the Family Histories podcast is currently recording its eighth series and the format of each episode is pretty much the same where I have a guest on and I interview them for about 20 minutes in the first part. Then there's a middle part where they tell a life story of someone uh, that they find fascinating in the middle section of the show for about 20 minutes again. And then the third part of the show, they share one of their brick walls. And we've all got really irritating, annoying, lingering, pesky brick walls. So they get to almost like with blogging, where you do what, what some people call uh, cousin bait, where you write about your brick wall and then maybe in years and years in the future, someone will message you, go, oh, we're related, and it will solve your brick wall. But this is in a podcast, an audio format. So you hear the guest share their brick wall. They kind of say where they've got up to, uh, maybe some of what they've tried to solve, and they kind of leave the listeners with a little challenge at the end of the episode. And when that bit's done, I avoid the usual, what I feel is usual, slightly awkward ending to a podcast episode of yeah thanks for coming on oh no it's great oh you hang up no you hang up that kind of thing and i script a little set of lines and for the listeners it sounds like they are following me through to my garage where we unveil a time machine and i pop the guest into my secret time machine and i zap them back in time so they can go and solve their brick wall for themselves or at least that's what it sounds like because i have lots of sound effects and uh funny lines to say and it just ends with the guest being zapped and the listeners can imagine what happened next uh, yeah that and that was a really fun ending um <laughs> it was it was certainly interesting and different because i end like you said eh, goodbye guy you hang up you ring <laughs> 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 so it is, yeah, it is there's nothing, cool nothing wrong with that. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, what prompted you to, to start the series in the first place? Uh, well, I started it in 2021. Uh, and in the UK, we'd had a series of lockdowns because of obviously COVID pandemic. And I woke up one February morning, a nice morning, uh, which is quite unusual for February here, but I woke up and I just thought I'm going to do a podcast. And I thought, what do I need to do this? And I realized I already had the equipment. So I had this microphone and the pop shield and the computer that could do it. And I thought, okay, I've got a kind of creative format that I could do with this time machine and the life story and the brick wall. And I, I knew that I could do that based on, on that format and that equipment. But then I think there's also an element because we'd been through a pandemic and because we'd had gone through all of these lockdowns and I live by myself, I think it was probably 
an element of kind of loneliness in in this as well and so it was a way of solving that as well it was it enabled me to to talk to people i'd never spoken to uh, like yourself bob and and a whole load of other guests that i've had on the show so it kind of solved all of those things gave me a creative output and a bit of fun and got me speaking to people yeah and you know what's interesting about that book because people say to me how do you just you know find these people and and you just talk to people you don't know and i to me, I yeah. find that so interesting. Uh, so, so how do you find your guests? I know how I find the guests. I go around and pester people, but how do you find your guests? <laughs> Gosh, don't tell my mom I talk to strangers. Gosh, she'd be going crazy. It's like all the against all the parenting advice you could ever give. Uh, <laughs> I literally talk to strangers. Uh, no, I in the first series I asked. I mean, there's, there's seven episodes per series, or maybe I should say season, because I think American audiences certainly would, would uh, go for seasons rather than uh, series, uh, but seven episodes in a season. And I think in that first season, I asked probably about three people that I knew, and those people were ones that I had met in person at conferences like the Who Do You Think You Are events in London and uh, and Birmingham and the genealogy shows and things like that, people that I knew and that I had got to know through social media, particularly through Twitter uh, and a little bit through uh, Facebook as well. So I knew I knew some of them. And then because I am quite active on Twitter uh, a long time before having this podcast, uh, I was just kind of picking up on different topics uh, and different people and trying to identify what kind of things that they seem to specialize in or what kind of areas do, do they research in typically that were maybe different from how I researched or the areas that I research in. So I was using that and then I just reached out to them. And for those seven guests in that first series, they were very brave. That's all I can say for me to say, hey, would you like to be on this podcast? Most of you don't have a clue who I am. We've never spoken before. We've never met before. And there's a weird format. And I'm going to script you some lines, which I want you to say back to me. And I'm going to zap you back in time. And they all very thankfully said yes. And I recorded with them. So and and since then, it's got a little bit easier. Uh, because there are some people who who come to me and say, Andrew, I'd like to be on your show. I'd really like to be a guest. I get publishers come to me and say, oh, we've got uh, an author whose book's coming out and that kind of thing. And so I kind of field these different uh, requests as well as my wish list, which is quite long for guests, and approach them directly. So it's a bit of a mixture based on the kind of combination of different stories I think I'm going to get for a series. Uh, yeah, and you know, I started pretty much the same way. I I went out to friends or a couple of relatives just to practice it. And when I go yeah. back and listen to the first ones, I'm like, oh my god, I was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and and I would talk too much. My wife told me you talk too much. You need to let the guests talk. So I've kind of uh, I've kind of grown into it. Uh, if you if you want to uh, look at it that way. Uh, so let's let's talk Bob, about you're doing, you're doing very well as as <laughs> as as one host to another, Bob. You're doing very well, and it, it is difficult if you're a host being on someone else's podcast to shut up and listen. Um, it, it is very tough to do that. No, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, so let's talk about the, the components because I, I I think the way you structured it is is pretty neat. So. Um, Let's talk about the interview and some of the guests. What you know, if you could give me a couple of the guests that you found the most interesting. Yeah, well, uh, one of the guests I've got, which is a series four episode called "The Unexpected," I talk to a genealogist who's been a genealogist for many decades called Elsa Churchill. She is, is the genealogist at the Society of Genealogists in London. And she talks about how her decades of researching her Churchill ancestors, and obviously she's got some British Churchills that she's very much aware of in history. Uh, she's researching her, her branch. And then she decides to take a DNA test. And that changed everything from a genealogy point of view. It came back with an unexpected set of results that kind of opened up a whole new branch that she had no idea of. So it's an interesting episode from my point of view because this DNA has completely changed 
changed her family history research. You know, it has given her this other branch to go research, but it's very uh, different from my own background in that, you know, I haven't been researching as long as she had, but I haven't had a DNA set of results that's changed uh, the biological um, path I thought was was correct. Yeah, and that's uh, interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, so speaking to Elsa was, was very interesting. Uh, we also spoke in that series for to a Swedish genealogist called Linda Kvist, and she talks about how she uncovered an ancestor who was believed to have died. He was a Swedish man, and he had gone to the US, and it was believed that he had gone to board the boat back to Sweden, and he died on the dock. And so everyone thought, you know, he's dead, but, you know, where on earth is he buried? And through her research, she discovers that he didn't die on the dock. He will carried on living for several years in this kind of second or undead life that he had. So, it, you know, all of these stories are, are, are fascinating to, to uncover, um, particularly when you, when you find something very different like that. Yeah, that that is something. Um, you know, my my cousin, um, who we years. I mean, we, we didn't know who each other was, although we grew up not far from each other in in New York. Um, yeah. She found out that her grandmother, and she she doesn't all she knows is that she boarded the trip. She boarded the boat to Italy to go back home with her husband, and never got back to Italy. And. There's no record that, I mean, you have to assume that she fell off the ship, right? But yeah, that's yeah. all. Tried to see, something like that. Yeah. yeah, that's all anybody really knows. And, you know, did she fall over? Did something else happen? You know, uh, they don't know. But so in, DNA is interesting because, you know, Italians don't do a lot of DNA. So how about the British? The, the, mm. do they, is it usual or unusual for them to do DNA testing? I think it's quite common for the British to, to do DNA testing. We kind of, I think geographically, we, as an island that has oh, invaded, colonized, uh, but traded as well, and a very kind of geographical uh, closeness to uh, Europe and Scandinavia, uh, but also lots of immigration to different countries as well. Uh, I think there's lots of British people who want to know how they are connected to the to the world around them or how that world connects to them, I guess you could say. Uh, so I think it is quite common for, for British family historians to to do DNA testing. And also because we're kind of in, uh, we're kind of central in Europe we all, and we get a lot of American uh, family history content as well, I think that helps with the different DNA tests too. So, you know, we obviously get Ancestry, we get My Heritage, uh, 23andMe, uh, living DNA or find my past via them. Um, so we get all of these different tests. So the family historians who I know here in the UK, we, I think, I don't think I know anyone who hasn't done DNA testing. And most of those I would imagine has probably done more than one test as well. Yeah, I did. I did too. I did ancestry and I did living okay. DNA because I figured yeah. since they were based in Europe, I would get more hits on the Italian, but the, the Italians don't do it. And I, and I, and I think I've talked to some of them because most of them, not most of them, but a lot of them now, they're still living or still have ties to a town where their family lived three, yeah. four, five hundred years ago. So they don't, they could just go to the cemetery and find everybody. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's pretty much the same for me. My, my family have lived in Cambridgeshire, which is a county in England, in the southern part of England, well, kind of Midlands of, uh, of England. Uh, and they have been there for about 400 years. And I mean, there's a couple of branches that go to neighboring counties, but, you know, it's not very far at all. It's, you know, 40 minutes in the car or something and they don't stray very far. And so when I'm going through the parish registers looking for, say, my surname of Martin, I can look down the parish registers and I'm going, right, OK, uh, paternal, 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 paternal. And in amongst them, I'll go, OK, maternal, paternal, maternal, paternal, maternal. They're all there together. They all knew each other, which is slightly alarming, but it's very easy from a family history point of view for me. And I think I'm very lucky in that respect. Uh, yeah, for sure. That You know, one of the... the 
easier things when you're researching Italian ancestors is that the women don't change their names. So uh, oh, okay. even even today they don't take the husband's name. So it's okay. it's it's easy in a lot of respects to do that. So the next section that you talk about is the life story. So uh, what's your life story? What have you found interesting in your family going back <laughs> three, four, five hundred years? <laughs> well, I, I have found uh, rioters, which I, uh, <laughs> these are rioters in the early 19th century. They are rioting because of an increase in the cost of living, essentially, which, which right now is quite familiar. I don't know to the same respect, but it, as the topic is quite familiar. And it's a cost of living that's affected by the cost of food, by by wages and also environmental factors because of a volcano that erupts in Indonesia. So it's all kind of related to to that. So I've got rioters. I've got several different rioters. There's also ones who who riot about being undercut because they were silk weavers and they travel to a few villages away and uh, destroy their silk looms and uh, obviously end up uh, going through the through the uh, justice system for that. But yeah, so there's a lot of rioters, but I will behave. And there are uh, other ones. Uh, one of the stories that that I found in my in my tree is about my about my great grandmother, and it's one of those kind of demonstrations of of the kind of fork in the road moments that we're presented multiple times a day in our daily lives, and. She was uh, one of about five children or six in total. And her father died when she was about four. And her mother was pregnant with their youngest child. And this mother, a young widow with you know, five, five soon to be six children, she had to make a decision. But thankfully, her sister, her married sister, lived in a town in Cambridgeshire called Littleport. And they had a big shirt factory that opened and it was all new being set up. And uh, these people uh, were advertising for, I think, uh, respectable young ladies and women to come and work uh, in the shirt factory where they would be making shirts, making buttonholes, uh, sewing on buttons, ironing, those kinds of things. And uh, they, she just took that decision to go and move to the same place where her sister was living. And then her daughters, who were now kind of growing up, they were working in the shirt factory. And that shirt factory uh, was a kind of a big employer in Victorian England. And the building is still there, but the factory is not because the factory, which was called Hope Brothers, which is a beautiful name, uh, it eventually got sold to Burberry's, which is still a brand today which uh you, some of your listeners may be familiar with that fashion brand and you know it basically changed their lives it brought income to to women and and um and and girls in the area in this kind of deeply rural fenland area that would otherwise be domestic servants uh housewives you know it enabled them to have that independence and freedom and their own uh income and so you know it was a big decision that she made but she did it and and it enabled her to have some independence uh and her daughters too and had she have not done that then my great-grandmother would not have met my great-grandfather and got married in that uh town church and i would not be here now yeah, isn't that funny that how how that works? My yeah. my grandfather uh, was studying to be a priest, and um, mm -hmm. the story is that he um, he was outside the seminary one afternoon, I guess, one morning, and my grandmother's carriage broke down because she had she came from a fairly well off family. He helped repair the carriage. They gave him a ride someplace, and he left the seminary, uh, and and I. You know, I, I wish, I, you know, one of the things, you know, when you talk about brick walls and go back, one of the thing I think yeah. that makes us all nuts is a, is the story true? Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think about in my grandmother's case, because of the family that she came from, he was studying the priest that 
they couldn't have been very happy about this marriage. You know, my, it, my, my children are adopted and, um, I've been able to trace my daughter back to England. Um, and she had some fascinating things. And one of them is she's a, she's a distant, distant, distant dispenser. Um, but have you had anybody that, um, has either ties to the States or gateway ancestors to the States? Have you run across that in, in your, uh, pursuits? I, I have an unexpected one in that, and I don't know how many greats this is. So I'm going to say five greats could be wrong. I think it's five greats. And I had this, uh, ancestor who was however many greats grandfather and he goes missing. And I thought, oh, he's died. And you know, he, he kind of goes missing when he's about, I think in his late sixties and I was thinking, okay, he's, you know, he's died in the 18. 70s 1880s something like that and uh he's vanished i can't maybe you know i just haven't found the record i haven't found the parish record or he's just recorded in a random parish that i haven't yet looked at or i've missed over it so i was looking for him and he had the name of james simpson bishop however sometimes he is simpson bishop samson bishop uh samson bishop samuel bishop j bishop and js bishop so very difficult to find the right one and so there were lots of lots of uh um false positives so i'd find someone's someone else's ancestor but not not mine and then i spotted a passenger list and this this i should say that this five times great grandfather had about at different times he had a total of about four wives and so he had lots of children uh maybe 15 or 16 children in total and his last marriage had taken him from the Fenland County of Cambridgeshire in kind of the South Midlands of, of the UK. And it had taken him up to uh, the cotton mill industry in Lancashire. Uh, so lots of lots of employment opportunities, but lots of hard work as well, and dangerous work as well in the cotton mills. And he's had this marriage to this fourth wife and she turns up in the censuses. And he doesn't. And that's why I thought he had died. But interestingly, when I, when I kept looking at this, I then realized that she said that she was married and he was missing. So I looked for all of the children and tried to kind of document where they were going. And I spotted that the oldest daughter from the first marriage had emigrated to the USA and accompanying them was him he was there the father was was with them so you know this daughter had got married she'd had about two or three children by that point and they'd gone over to the us and he'd gone with them i was watching to see whether he would come back and i didn't find it and i noticed that by about 1901 or maybe the 1891 census one of those two the fourth wife then says widow on her census return I thought, okay, has is this a case of, you know, the seven years separation so she can kind of say that it's a divorce because divorce would still be quite difficult at that point to get. Uh, so she's just said widow to kind of accept the end of that or has he actually died and she is the widow. Uh, and what I found was, was that he had been in the US for long enough that he naturalized in his late 60s in 1886 I think something like that and yeah he he was there and I think he's I think they were in Illinois somewhere uh I can't remember the exact uh place name but he was there and he was there with the with the older daughter and her family and so I like to think that I have an an American five times great grandfather, which is kind of fun to say, because it's very different from the Fenland life that he would have known and that a lot of his children know, because I descend from his oldest child from his first marriage who stayed in that, in those Fenland, in those Fenland villages. So it's, it's fun to say that I have this, uh, American, uh, five times great grandfather. Yeah. I see. And that's what I'm talking about, you know? Why did he go? You know, did he have a fight with his wife? Did the daughter convince? <laughs> That's so interesting. Yeah, that kind of stuff. I mean, 
Yeah, and it you know it may well have been that their relationship ended. They just got to the end of their relationship, and and he went with the daughter, and she stayed with the youngest of the children because the oldest of the children were you know getting married and having their own children by now. Uh, or did he go with her for a while, travel with this with this daughter for a while, and intend to come back, but actually thought no, I'm going to stay here and naturalize because that's obviously a an indicator of intent to stay is to have been there for however many years it is i can't remember how many it is and to naturalize i've, I've seen the document uh and yeah it i wonder whether they just their relationship just failed they couldn't afford a divorce so they kept apart for a number of years uh and she stayed in lancashire until she died so that's that's a, that's such a great story such a great story um so now the last the last section that you kind of do before you go in the time machine is is the brick wall. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you, do you have a brick wall? Yeah. I do. I actually have to, because because my podcast has a time machine. I was able to engineer a situation where I was a guest on my own podcast. And for this one episode, the time machine in the previous episode, and right in the last few moments, the time machine goes wrong. And it somehow flips me into like a kind of alternate version where I've got, where I'm now the guest on, on this podcast. And I've got this guest host, uh, Dr. Van der Vyporska. She is the host in this alternate version of reality. And so she interv interviews me as the guest. So in this episode, which is called The Rioter, uh, she uh, talks to me and I've revealed my brick wall. And my brick wall is one that has been bugging me for, I don't know, 15 years perhaps. And it's one where I really want to kill off my however many greats, again, sorry, I forgot, but however many greats, grandmother, and her name's Mary Clark. And the reason I am so desperate to kill her off is because she played the archetypal wicked stepmother to uh, to uh, her her um, husband's children. And there's lots of very long court reports uh, where these children who were only kind of seven and eight, about that kind of age, they're standing up in court, undoubtedly with her in the room as well, and giving evidence to say just how she was uh, physically abusive to them. So how they, how she would push them to the floor and how she would not give them food and how her children would be treated well. And they, these would be the children that she had with their father. So, uh, you know, she was, she was his second wife. Uh, so those children would be treated very well, but his children from his first marriage were treated very poorly. So it is simply because she is such a horrible piece of work that I'm desperate to kill her off. That's Cinderella. <laughs> that's like, it sounds yes, like a threat. Yeah. That's, that's unbelievable. So about what year was that when they, they, they had to go to court? Uh, well, it, I, I smelt a rat in about kind of <laughs> uh, 1841 when I could find the children and they were scattered in uh, workhouses and houses of industry, which was kind of the support system uh, in in England at that time. So if you were if you were poor or you were unwell, you went into the workhouse, and if you were a child, you were kind of taught different skills. So these children start turning up there, and I'm thinking, oh, why are they not with their parents? Um, and then I find uh, their father, and I find the mother, and the mother is is my ancestor, this wicked stepmother. And she's in the jail in Ipswich in Suffolk in England. And she's there with her youngest child. And so I was able to then track back to find this big newspaper report with the with the court appearance. And it is a big report. And I was able to then find the uh, kind of jail admissions book as well, a scan of that. And it showed that she was sentenced to, I think, six months and two months of that was with hard labor so that would have been rightly horrible for her to to go through but because she had this small child i think her name was emily uh who was just a few months old the the child had to go there as well so you know a very 
odd start to Emily's life, but she had to be with her her mother to to make sure that she got the care that she needed, I guess, whilst her mother was imprisoned and receiving hard labor. The father, who was uh, who was guilty too for neglect, uh, he was going to prison for I think only about two months, and like one month of that was hard labor. So he he, despite being the father and him being found guilty of neglect. He got off rather lightly, really. Yeah, you know, I, I find that fascinating because you you don't think about that happening, you know, almost 200 years ago that they put people in jail for, no. for things like that. That's that's really that's really something. And, you know, sad. Yeah, and, like thankfully, said. and thankfully they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Boy, that's some that's some story. But you know, like you said, like I said, when you were talking about her, I kept thinking about it. This is she's Cinderella's mother or stepmother. Right? <laughs> maybe she was the prototype. I don't know who wrote the story or who wrote the book, but you know, maybe, maybe uh, there must have been more women like that, I guess, or or whatever back then. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, because I you yeah, know, I'm sure they, I'm sure it wasn't unique. Yeah, because you know, a lot of women died died in childbirth, or there was lots of other stuff going on, and. And uh, yeah. men would marry just to have somebody to watch, to take care of the kids and things like that. Um, so yeah, and and it it kind of gets exposed because the villagers where they lived, they kept seeing the children from this first marriage around the village in rags. And I think one of them in the court describes them as kind of living skeletons, and they would see them around the village in all weather. So. They would they they approached them and and asked them what was wrong and so these 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 girls very bravely told them what was wrong and obviously then had to go through the through the court and re recount it all but yeah I mean she rightly went to prison absolutely and that's why I'm desperate to kill her off because she's just a nasty bit of work I'm not proud of her at all uh, no yeah I have a couple of I have a couple of those of mine way way back uh, you know uh, through my grandmother's family. Uh, my paternal grandmother and, and and those people who was killing off who and whose brother was murdering who and all this kind of stuff. Um, so, so, um, you know, some, some advice for people starting out, what would you suggest to people who are just starting out doing their own research? When I started out, I was a teenager and a late teenager. And that was in a time where we had dial-up internet and we had lots of telephone directories and people wrote letters so the place that I started was writing letters to distant relatives and quizzing my parents uh, as to what they knew and even if they just knew a little tiny bit I would write that down so write down everything and contact those distant relatives and I found I found that if I wrote to the distant relatives, and, and by this I mean kind of second cousins, great aunts, great uncles, that kind of that kind of distance. Uh, and if I wrote to them, I would nearly always get a reply. I would draw a family tree as much as I knew for their bit of the family and send it to them because I learned that if you present some wrong information to a not intentionally, but if you send some wrong information to a distant relative, they're going to write back and say, no, actually, it's this. And they're giving you gold at that point. You know, that's what you want. You want to be cor corrected with the facts that they're going to give you. But sometimes they would also give you photographs. And sometimes those photographs would be of your close relatives because those people would be distant. And this and this may be from a time where they had photographs taken and then they would send them out to their cousins or their great aunts who were perhaps living away or perhaps just um, they didn't see them very often, but they would be from your close relatives and they might be pictures of your close relatives. So it was very useful for kind of getting photographs and getting trees and getting trees corrected and giving you more clues to then research in the archive. So I would, whilst the dial-up days with the bleeping modems and uh, are kind of behind us as affectionate as I am to them but uh, uh, yeah I'm glad we passed that uh, whilst you've got these distant relatives around you write to them because whilst you're going to get this family history 
information in these photographs is going to be really good. But I also found that it also, in my opinion, helped to kind of bring the family closer because, you know, time time can get allow families to drift apart and you know may, maybe maybe a grandparent dies and and you lose track of of their nieces and nephews or the, or you know their their siblings family basically but if you can identify them and write to them it can help bring them back together again and then you might get kind of a collective approach to doing your family history uh, yeah, and that's what happened to me with with my cousin Linda, because she had photographs of you know my dad's family that I had never seen. Yeah. Uh, but what possessed you as a teenager to embark on this journey? Uh, well, a whole ton of curiosity, but that's because I came home from school one day, obviously living at home at this time uh, as a teenager. I came home from school one day and there was a piece of paper on my parents' dining table and it had, uh, I recognized it straight away as a family tree and I was looking at it and it said Martin family. And I looked at it and I thought, why is this guy married to the wrong, married to not my grandmother? And then I started looking at it a bit more and I was thinking, well, I don't recognize any of these people on this piece of paper. Who, who are they? And so I asked my mother and she said, oh yeah, your uncle came around. So this is my dad's brother came around. And uh, he brought this family tree and uh, these are all your relatives. And from that moment on, I thought, well, I'm going to find out who all those people are. And That's on that tree were, were my great grandparents, one of whom was the person who I just told you about, about moving to the shirt factory. She was on there and I had no idea what her name was. And yet she was my great grandmother. Yeah. See, these things don't happen by accident. There was a reason for him to come there no. with that tree so you could find everybody else. Yeah. Isn't that funny how that, how that yeah. stuff works yeah, out? Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, been addicted really... since. <laughs> uh, no, I know we all get. I, <laughs> I, there's one or two of us loonies in every family that has to find out all of this stuff, which I, <laughs> which I think is which I think is good because I I truly believe uh, that there's I don't know force or whatever, but but they they want to be found. I I, I really truly yeah. believe that. Uh, I I don't know why, but that's the way I feel. So this is great, Andrew. I appreciate it. Uh, so where can people find the, once again, where can people find the podcast? Uh, and uh, for those listening who haven't heard it yet, I'm going to be coming on soon, right? Uh, yes, you are. There's a spoiler there, Bob. Yes, <laughs> you <laughs> you will be in, in the new series. And uh, I'm looking at the first week of November for series eight that seems to it's on target for that so i think will be the first week of of november 2024 uh and uh we'll be going live with with season eight and the best place to find it if you go to familyhistoriespodcast.com then you'll find all the latest updates you can hear all of the previous episodes you know this is our this will be our eighth series i've uh we've released uh episodes with 49 different guests so far so you know we'll be adding another seven to that soon so they're they're mounting up so there's plenty of there plenty of episodes for people to listen to on different topics and we have guests who who talk about family history from loads of different countries around the world with different backgrounds uh so yeah hopefully hopefully they'll enjoy it and and, and i like the way you have an index too because you you um you have keywords for different things to be able for whether it's by country or whether it's by uh yep. um different categories that that people could hone in on and uh find something great to listen to um well thanks again andrew i really appreciate you taking the time this has been fascinating you know like you i love to hear these stories it's been an absolute joy bob to to take part in this podcast and for you to very kindly invite me on without any italian ancestry that i know of Yet, but I will I, let you know if I find any. There, there's got to be a Roman back there somewhere. <laughs> well, I've got lots of Scandinavian DNA, so I'm not too sure about that. Maybe some Vikings. Maybe that's where the rioting comes from. I don't know, but my Viking blood. But yeah, no Italians yet, I'm afraid. <laughs>